Hello, everyone. No one's here. Hey, gear girl. Chris. Ellie, good to see you guys. Waiting on Larry and Dan. Howdy, everyone. There's Dan. Carpus side. Joe Bart. Hey, Dan. Hey. All right, now we're just waiting on that other crazy redhead, Larry. <laughs> There's Larry. My face is so much closer to the camera than last time. <laughs> right. I know, it's uncomfortable, isn't it? Oh, there we go. Larry, what's up? What's up? What's up? What's happening, bud? Not much, fellas. All right, guys. Super excited to uh, have you guys back on here and do some tying with you. Yeah, man, this could be great. Look at all the carp gear. Do you, do you got clothes that don't have carp on them, Larry? <laughs> uh, no. Everything I own is carp themed, carp carp related. This is covered in carp stuff. A cool uh, mulberry patch on here, courtesy of Danny. That's also. cool. Um, oh, no big deal. Latest Cornhusker Carp Fest logo. Yeah. Uh, Dude, you got that old Carp Pro sticker on there. Yeah, I do. I, You know what? I still have a big stack of those. If anybody wants one, um, <laughs> send me cool. uh, Yeah. I'll get one next time I see Here. you, Larry. <laughs> All right. So without a whole lot further ado, uh, everyone who's here, good to see you. Welcome to the Carp Conversations, episode two. Last time we spent some time talking about carp behavior, situations that we target carp in, and all of that was kind of to lead to, you know, what kind of materials are we going to choose to use when we're tying a carp fly to target carp? Uh, we talked a bit about what makes a carp fly a carp fly. Um, if you'd like to answer that philosophical question, go ahead and check out uh, Carp Conversations episode one. Uh, it's in my posts. Um, tonight, we're going to tie some of the flies that we talked about. And so got Larry Dostal here coming at us from Nebraska, Dan Frazier uh, coming from South Dakota. Uh, we did intros last time, uh, but yep, Larry and Dan have both fished for carp forever. Larry's been the president of the Cornusker Fly Fishers uh, at various points. Dan is a very well-known author and uh, just carp activist. Anything you guys, you guys want me to say about you or you guys want to say about yourselves? Carp activist is pretty good. I like that. Yeah, yeah. I I like that too. Yeah, somebody's got. We're just generally you. nice guys too. <laughs> yeah, <That's> right. <laughs> Whatever happened to being good people? Can we just be? Good yeah. People? I can vouch for these other two on this call. So. <laughs> All right, guys. I've got two, not just good guys. I've got two great guys here with me, Larry and Dan. And so we're each going to tie a pattern here tonight. Um, <laughs> Larry's going to get us started off, and he's going to be tying his four-eyed worm. And uh, if you missed it last time, my introduction to this fly is um, I love fishing hybrids. John Montana's hybrid is just an absolute staple uh, carp fly. Um, and it, it's one of my go-tos in, especially clear water, early season, um, Larry really broke the mold for me, though, when I saw his fly box for the first time. And instead of a worm tail with a nymph going up, you know, it was just pink chenille wrapped up. And uh, I thought it was the goofiest looking fly ever uh, at first. And then I quickly realized that it did not matter. And he was catching so many fish with it. And now it occupies the largest amount of my fly box, more more of my fly box and then the other fly. So we're going to have Larry start us off and tie his four-eyed worm and um, he'll kind of talk us through it, but uh, chime in with any questions, guys. Um, you know, 
uh, Dan and I are going to, especially I will keep an eye on questions and uh, make sure that uh, Larry can answer any questions you guys have. Sounds, I'll get it started off then. Ahead, so, Larry. you know, a quick thing about this fly, I call it the four-eyed worm just because it's got a, a set of four bead chain eyes. And I, I like using bead chain, first off, because it's cheap. It's an inexpensive material. It works well. It does what it's supposed to do. I mean, first and foremost, it's inexpensive. Like that's like the, that's the starting point. I mean, and it's it's readily available, and you can buy it in really big schools for for not a lot of money. Um, so I would recommend for for the for most carp size flies, you want to go with like the large eye, and depending on where you where you source your your eyes, it's going to be like large or extra large. But if you look up a 3.8 or 4.1 uh, like millimeter size, that's like the size, that's like that large to XL uh, size bead chain. Um, so that's what you want. Um, a medium bead chain, you know, a smaller size will work on a smaller uh, four-eyed worm. But really, um, the main thing behind this fly, it's, it's like taking the versatility and simplicity of like a San Juan worm and just having a little bit of extra weight to it and that that uh you know four crosswise of, of bead chain lets that fly just lay flat on the bottom really well especially in like moderate light current which is a lot of the water that i uh you know started carp fishing on here in in, uh, in nebraska so um so without further ado let's start with the hook i'm starting with the just like a gamakatsu c14 um i'm tying this on a size two um but you can use any like egg style hook this is a you know this is a bigger hook but it's really it's not too big for this for this platform here um the other materials you need is a standard this is like 140 denier um utc i'm using pink honestly a lot of the flies i tie uh i tie with i'm just using 210 denier and white and then i just uh little sharpie and whatever color i need later black white purple doesn't matter but i but it seems like i can buy a lot of white thread and I have sharpies, so it's, it's it's just a convenience thing for me. If you want to get a hundred different kinds of thread, that's uh, that's on you. Um, and then we're doing for for the standard uh, uh, four-eyed worm. It's just your standard ultra chenille, not the micro stuff, not the really really small diameter, but just your standard San Juan worm. Um, and we'll go with all pink. Um, one of my favorite variations, though, is like a natural tail with like a pink body, and you know, called banana split. My friend Joey turned me on to that color, and it works great. But honestly, any you know, I tie them in all black. I tie them in olives, greens. It works great. So first and foremost, I cut myself one section of pink. You know, that's going to be like my tail chassis. And then I have like a long working piece that I'm going to use. And that's just, you know, just six, seven inches, just something that you can like handle easily um, and, and then palm around the hook easily. So I got my two sections. This is how I tie it. You can tie it with one piece. Just let this kind of this, this kind of simple guide pattern just inspire you to just tie a lot of flies. So first and foremost, get your hook in the vise. Is that in focus pretty good there? There we go. And I just I just lay down a thread base base and I fill I kind of fill the shank and then I actually go up the hook bend just a little bit. And then I bring my thread right back to the hook eye. So then, so I do not tie my B chain on first. I actually tie that on like second to last step here. So now I tie my, what's going to be my tail piece. And I line it up essentially just, just right behind the hook eye. And I'm going to fill the entire shank with this. Is that the, so what this does, is that the shorter piece, Larry? That's the shorter piece? This is, yeah, sorry. This is like the shorter piece, which would be the tail. I'm actually going to trim this shorter at the end of the fly here. Gotcha. Um, so that's, yeah, that's just, a, you know, a working piece. And I actually wrap that down the hook bend just a little bit, and that'll cause the, you know, cause the worm tail to, like, be up in the air just a little. I mean, and you can go all the way down the hook bend if you want, like a, you know, like a trouser worm style. Um, I don't really find the need to do that um, in, in the way I present to a lot of fish. It's not really, it, it's honestly not, you know, most of the fish I fish for, this fly is not sitting on the bottom forever. Um, 
you know, they're going to see it with the drag and drop and they're, they're either going to react to it or they're going to reject it. Um, so anyway, I fill that body. And so doing this step, filling the entire body with your base tail material really adds to the durability of this fly. I mean, we've caught up to 20, you know, fish on one of these flies. And, and just doing this step makes it super durable. So now I, I advance my thread back to right to the hook eye. And now I'm going to lay down my body wrap piece. So this is like my long, you know, you can, you, you can just leave it on the, in the package if you want to at this step. Either way, same tying point. If you really want to get technical, you can kind of tie on like half of the hook shank and then tie on the other half. I just kind of mash it on there. It's going to be fine in the end. <clears throat> And again, I now I, I bring it right back just about to the base of that uh, that previous thread there, that previous chenille body. And now is when I tie in my bead chain. So I I bring my thread back, and I like to a good measuring point. You can you can tie this this four eyed. You can tie it all the way. You know wherever you want to balance the fly. I find it works best and to finish the fly if you kind of just measure like one. I width one you know one bead chain I width back from the hook eye. That's just like a good measurement starting point. And then now you just figure eight that on there. So I'm just I'm just figure eight wrapping now, you know, your standard Clouser style, you know, crazy Charlie style figure eight wraps. Um, do a couple underneath. And so doing this chenille like base like on on the on that top hook plane raises up like the center of gravity a little bit it kind of helps that fly flip over theoretically you know whatever to me it just it just adds a little bit to the durability of the fly i mean in, in my use <coughs> larry uh i'll probably ask uh, this again when you get to the end but um uh, I'm just going to point out for people that are, you know, watching this, I know there's a couple of people that are going to be on here that are sort of new to fly tying. Um, like, for instance, Larry and I do not tie this fly the same way. Uh, I measure one piece of like three and a half inch uh, of chenille, and I tie it in at the tail, like with a couple oh. of wraps, and then I just wrap it up the body. And so I, I, did, I didn't know until I was watching you that you used two pieces like that. I, I only use two pieces just to get a little bit thicker body, too. If sure. you do the one piece, it's a thinner, it's a little bit thinner. Yeah. It, it, it really doesn't matter. This is how I started tying, and this is how I just kept tying. <laughs> I needed to make one more step in this thing. So, so now the only step, so now we got our, we got our short piece here, which is going to be my tail, which I'm going to trim at the end. And then we got our long palm ring piece. I'm not a huge fan of like using the rotary function to palmer stuff because I'm just, it, it just makes sense to me to just hand wrap it. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to wrap it I, and I just go the same direction I wrap the thread. That first wrap though, you really want to cinch it down. And now every subsequent wrap, you want to wrap pretty tight, just right next to the previous one. So you find just the feel, you find that the integrity of that chenille holds up, like you don't need to tie it in. Uh, I mean, it, it's a, it's a strong enough material. It doesn't come apart when you're when you're fishing it. Cor yeah, correct. I mean, really. I mean, after a lot of fish, it'll slowly get thinned out. But really, I mean, I've caught, I've used a similar style of fly, like a like a bluegill spider, and I've caught literally dozens. I've caught a hundred bluegill on one fly before it was even unusable. Yeah. So, so it's not it's not like it's breaking in the middle and unwrapping itself. No, as long as you, as long as you make sure you fill, this is like the only like really crucial spot is, is you just want to wrap every wrap subsequent, like pretty close to the previous one yeah. and fill that shank and keep the tension on pretty high. You don't want this loose at all. Cause it, again, if it's loose, then it can come undone yeah. really, you know, that's, that's a pretty much it. Now there's a couple of ways to finish this fly. So once you get like right behind the hook eye, like you know, if you're using the same color thread as your chenille, like, and you care about that, you can really just finish it behind the bead chain, and then you just kind of have, like, a, a short kind of exposed thread head. Honestly, it does, that is probably just fine, and it probably isn't, you know, fish are not going to care about that. If you want to cover up this wrap, you know, cover up, like, the, the bare hook shank up here, um, the, the kind of best, there's, there's a couple ways to do it. You know, you can just do one wrap over it, and it'll kind of cover it. To me, 
what works really well is if you get, if you do like a cross wrap, and then you kind of come under the eye, and then you do like a adjacent like a another cross wrap, and you, and it kind of crams a bunch of that chenille and fills all the gaps, and then right you know then you have that just enough just enough space to make a head here. You can capture that with your thread. Maybe I do one or two cross wraps with my thread, and now I just <clears throat> to make this fly super durable. Like I usually do a couple cross wraps, and I don't trim it super close. I leave just like you know a barely like a sixteenth of that chenille, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna really get that good with my thread. And you make like a pretty decent little thread head here, and you'll you'll get that chenille captured, and I'm kind of squishing my thread back towards the hook eyes a little bit and kind of cramming that full. And that's and that's really it. And it's this fly is gonna be super duper durable. Um, just doing my one half hitch there just to kind of get her centered. And then I just hand whip finish it a couple times, one, two, three, maybe do it twice. Um, and again, this, so that fly is good to go and it'll catch a lot of fish. I finish my flies with super glue. Now this may be a contentious thing huh. with some folks, but again, like I'm not, you, fly fishing for carp you're not bait fishing for them they're not being attracted to the fly by scent and they really shouldn't be you know at least in my experience my fly's not sitting there for a minute for the carp to come you know smell it and, and reject it it's rejecting it because it looks wrong or it feels wrong or it spooks them or something like that um again that's just how i present to a lot of fish you know, a lot of my fish is the drag and drop, and they're either going to, you know, they either see it and react to it, or they refuse it, um, like, instantly. So, I don't think they don't have time to smell whatever tiny bit, and I'm basically just, this is just the off-the-shelf Gorilla Super Glue. Um, I'm just basically just letting a little tiny, like, bare drop come out of the of the tip and I'm just barely touching it to the thread. So it's like it's like barely getting any, but it really it's just enough to seal the thread wraps on there. And it dries quick and it's done and it's cheap. Um, so the body of this, I like to I essentially like to have the chenille almost just like a little bit more than like one body length um, back. It doesn't I don't like them super long. You know if you if you if you trim them really long um, you know, you can always trim it on the water. I mean, if you, if it's too long, I just, I don't find that they need to be super long tails personally, but that's about it. That That's the fly right there. Um, I mean, I, I didn't bring my lighter down here. You can singe the tail. I, I really don't find that ultra chenille comes undone. Again, that's John Montana, you know, historically has not singed his tails on his hybrids. So, and, and, and again, that's what this pattern was basically based off the hybrid. I mean, I mean, it's a chenille tail, simple body. I just streamlined it. You know, you can do the body with a dubbing. Um, uh, my friend Carson, he ties a simple fly that's almost like a hybrid without the, you know, without the hackle. And it's and it sinks really good. And it's essentially the same type of fly. It gets the same. So it's a, it's a good starting point. You can fill a box with it. Again, I have a bunch of just all black. I have a bunch of olives. I mean, that's a damselfly imitation right there. I mean, they work for me. I can crank, I can literally fill a whole box or if I'm, you know, tying some flies for a newbie, I can, you know, tie a dozen of these in, a, in, in an hour and then they can go out and catch carp the next day. Um, and then one cool tip, you know, if, if this fly is splashing too hard for your carp or it's spooky, you know, on the water, you can bust off these eyes and then you can make it basically like a, you know, just a two-eyed worm, which I think there's another video that has real good detail uh, that Luke tied a two-eyed worm, didn't you? Um, yeah, I can I can share those after this. Yep, if anybody's uh, curious to have a slightly uh, more just precise video of it, um, uh, Carpicide uh, used a couple of videos that I made uh, a couple of years ago, so we can we can share those if anybody's interested. Um, yeah, and if everybody, if anybody's having a similar reaction to uh, like a similar reaction to what I had the first time I saw this fly, I guess the only thing I would say is just tie some and fish some. Um, one question I have right away for you, Larry, is why do you like to go pink? You know, that's just I, it's a San Juan worm color, and really, there's a, so that's that is an interesting question too, and I've put thought into it, and it's 
that worms are different colors and and there's not just like you know plain brown earthworms you know in the banks of streams there's pink worms there's tan colored worms and around here we have green worms they look just like a regular earthworm but they're green so i mean that that's like one aspect of it the other thing is you can see pink really well like as an angler which lets you you know gives you that visual feedback of you know you can see that fly disappear you can track it you know it's sink rate in the water um that's that's probably the like nowadays like that's the most important thing um if i need a natural presentation i'll, I'll do a dark fly if i need to if i really need to see it or if i'm fishing with somebody you know guiding somebody that needs to see the fly i will i will put a pink fly on because they can track it they can see where it is they can see the fish react to it or eat it i mean that's that's kind of that's really what i landed on pink and it, you know and it works <laughs> i mean really it's just like historical good you know color that really works around here yeah and all the other places i've tried it i mean i've, I've come into few circumstances where like a pink worm fly doesn't like like actually gets rejected um it it's more more often than not it just works well so i just uh two weeks ago i clipped off the pink uh worm that i had tied on my fiberglass seven weight and there's no telling how long it had been tied on before i clipped it off you know probably probably a lot of august yep so. yep <laughs> probably since yeah, probably since that last time i fished with you <laughs> yeah cool <laughs> Uh, well, if anybody has any questions about that fly, feel free to chime in. We can always go back to it. Um, Annie says, fly cement sucks. Super glue is the truth. Um, <laughs> the, yeah. the other, I mean, the, the thing about super glue is it dries in like two minutes. Like, I mean, yeah. I mean, that fly is dry now. So yeah. I can go, I mean, that's the beauty of it really. So, all right. Well, uh, Dan is going to, Ty McLovin. Um, Dan, I've never fished this pattern, so I don't have a whole lot to say about it yet. So can I have you introduce this fly a little bit? Yeah, so the McLovin is a pattern uh, that was um, uh, designed by Trevor Tanner, McTag Tanner, the guy that runs flycarpet.com. <laughs> and um, I, I think I mentioned this in the last one, Trevor's a, a rocket scientist in real life, and that's sort of how he approached fly time. Uh, hyper creative, very um, sort of um, understanding of physics, right? And uh, so there's a lot of that. Even that that to this day, I was just watching here some underwater video, bathtub video of how the fly moves and stuff. I mean, that's kind of how he goes about his process. Which means that the tying can look a little technical, and, and I'll get the camera closer where you can see it. It can look a little technical, but it's really not not that challenging of a fly. Um, it's a really interesting damsel small nymph pattern, um, and uh, it works as a crayfish, uh, um, a, sort of a, a sm very small crayfish, I think. Um, but the unique features about this lineup of flies that Trevor is that he sort of invented the tri what he calls the tripod head, uh, which we're going to build on here, um, and you just don't see that very often. In fact, I've never seen it before, and it's a really unique way to create so there's two things he's trying to always create. He's always thinking about drag and weight to try to make it stand on his head, right? So this was a way to get the center of gravity where he wanted it on the fly hook and then to keep the drag behind that point of center of gravity. And so you'll also notice that one thing that's interesting about a lot of Trevor's flies is when you do put in hackle, which we will on this one, the hackle is very rarely tied in right up at the eye. Because that's creating a bunch of drag on the part that you want falling quick, most quickly. So there's a lot of times that on this one in particular, where the hackle's actually gonna be tied in back at the bend of the hook. So there'll be a tail, there'll be a little bit of dubbing, there'll be tackle, and then there'll be this tripod head to make it stand up. Stands up great, moves great in, in water. Um, what I think about this is there's plenty of weight and material on it that uh, you can fly a fly that gets down, or you can lighten everything up and you can get a nice sort of mid-column damsel, uh, damsel-y uh, look and fly. It's really, it's really a unique design. Um, flies are smaller than you think that's sort of the rule of thumb i mean even when i was watching um uh watching larry i was happy to see how th that translated you know it's it's that was a big carp fly hook that he's using and it's a small hook you know and that's all about hook shake like 
Um, same here. When you look at a picture of this fly, when the first time I looked at a picture of the fly, I was like, oh, okay. And then when I saw an actual fly, I was like, shit, that thing's only an inch long. I thought it was a three-inch looking fly. Um, everything's about size. Um, so uh, what I'm going to be using is I'm actually tying on uh, uh, C14S uh, glow bug uh, hook. This is a size four, which is a little bigger than, than I would normally tie on. Um, but it's got that short shank because it's that glow bug, so, so that works out just fine. Um, and I have a bead on this one, as you can see. And that's the beginning of that tripod, right? So on some of his, of, of Trevor's, he'll actually even reverse the bead. You know, it's got a wide hole on one side and a narrow hole on the other. He'll reverse it so the wide hole actually makes it fall even farther in, in, onto the eye. In this case, I've got it up on there in the more traditional way with the hole in the back. Um, uh, but uh, um, but, with the, but it's, uh, uh, it'll still be far enough forward that it'll, it'll absolutely hold for us. And before um, you uh, before you get too much further, I just want to say to uh, I would rearrange the video of this. Like, so I don't know how you see this, Dan, but I see me bigger than you guys, and I can't. And that's what people are probably going to see <laughs> when they're watching this because they're da I'm downloading my video to post. Uh, yeah. So we apologize for that. That's just kind of how it is. But this isn't supposed to be an HD video of any of these flies, you know. There's there is information about these flies out there. This is an opportunity to talk through these flies, talk about what you do, talk about what materials matter, talk about what materials don't matter, or you know how you can flex them and things like that. So um, I, right. I meant to say that right at the outset. Yeah, but yeah, if you're really looking for an instructional video on how to tie this, you, you're gonna Google uh, the McLovin and you're gonna go and see Trevor's YouTube video, which is super detailed, super step by step, super high def. Um, I'm just, I'm not going to be able to recreate that here. And the fact is, Tr Trevor's like a, a Mozart of the flies. I mean, his stuff is absolutely fabulous. Mine will not look like that gorgeous. There is something that's really <laughs> interesting I want to talk about as I, uh, um, before I get started here. Larry mentioned that he uses a Sharpie to color his thread, and he uses uh, super glue. Um, and I actually was a little bit surprised to hear him do that. Larry catches the hell out of fish. He knows what he's talking about. I, that I would trust him. I will say, though, that traditionally, if you talk to Trevor, you talk to John, and in my fishing, and maybe because we're targeting so many spilt, relatively still water fish, um, nothing with scent is, 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 is sort of the mantra. So um, we don't, you know, I, I'm not going to use any head cement in this case. Uh, um, and uh, and, and the, even the Sharpie coloring, the first thing I thought was, well, I wonder if that's going to give off some smell. So, you know, I, I'm not coloring it. Does it make that much difference? I don't know. It, I, I really don't know. I, but I know um, uh, that uh, at least um, at one point it was uh, that there was a lot of guys who believed that keeping smell off their their flies was critical. I, I know a couple of guys. Um, Adam Hope is a real killer uh, fly fisherman. Used to used to be a real uh, heavy in the carp game, and he would you know wash his hands in mud before he touched his fly, and he would roll his you know he was, he was serious about that scent and taste. So you know they do utilize. So carp have a sense of smell uh, um, that's um, a, a lot like a shark's sense of smell, right? They have a ton, really a really well-defined olfactory senses. The interesting thing, they also have taste buds um, all over their lips, their gill plates, their eyeballs, all the way back to their pectoral fins. They've got taste buds all over. So they're like a big tongue in the water. They're actually tasting their way a lot. So uh, I'm not. I'm not arguing with Larry. He catches a ton of fish. However, if you do notice that you're getting some, you're having some problems with rejection issues, it is one of the things to keep in your mind. Is did I put scent on? Did I just grab a bunch of chewing tobacco before I grabbed the? I mean, did I do something that's making this the, the water not taste right? I would, I would bear that in mind. Um, but you know, on the other hand, um, like I said, Larry catches a bunch of fish with the, and uh, and it, it's all become situational. And I, I, I'm, I. I would second that too, because I mean, and John especially is fishing for fish that are eating clams. Like that, that food like doesn't doesn't move at all. And like he's fishing, he's getting really close, and like you know, letting that fish. I mean, his his carp fishing is a little bit more precise than a lot of the stuff I deal with too. So I would say that it probably is a factor. So I mean, I, thing, I would, I would. Yeah, that's one thing that's really important. And, and Larry, you just hit it perfectly. Larry does a great job with his presentation and with that fly design of creating almost a reaction strike from these fish, right? He got the drag and drop and they're, and they're jumping on it. Um, 
if you're in a situation where um, the fish are more likely to be working up on your fly and you're hoping to that they will see it or you're going to move it slightly and they will move towards it, you may want to keep a keep keep an eye on um, on the scent stuff. But there is no scientific evidence to suggest it actually does anything. There's just a bunch of fly fishermen watching behavior, and you know what that means. Uh, we do have a tendency to see patterns where patterns don't exist. So uh, um, I would pay uh, – uh, uh, but it is, it is, it is why uh, he mentioned that there may be some controversy, controversy around that. Um, so I've got my hook. And I've just got my bead uh, resting on my hook. I'm gonna fly. I'm gonna uh, tie with a. Uh, it's a two ten denier, um, uh, uh, and I'm just gonna use black. The reason I'm going with black, this is not a black fly, but I'm gonna be using Cohen's carp dub, which I'll show you guys in a little bit. It's a super model dubbing. There's all kinds of colors in it, um, and I'm using natural squirrel pine squirrel, which is also naturally modeled, and my feathers are naturally modeled, so I, I don't feel uncomfortable having some that that black thread kind of integrated in there. Um, uh, Trevor, when he ties this, when he ties this fly, you know, he'll use the pine squirrel, and then he'll use a real orange body, and then he even uses like a pink shrimp shrimp head, oftentimes. So you can get real bright colored, in which case you maybe want to think about matching your thread more closely. I'm going for a super natural colors at this point, real, real brown black model tan kind of kind of fly so we're going to start by creating that tripod head that i was talking about you can see i got my bead right right behind my uh my hook eye and i'm just going to start my thread right behind it and build a little dam to keep that try to keep that bead in place first thing i'm going to do is lose my scissors because that's a uh, standard operating procedure um so I'm just building a little bit of dam to hold that that bead in place, and then I'm going to bring my wrap my thread back to my hook point, just beyond the hook point. My dam wasn't quite big enough. There we go. And then I'm going to come to just behind the hook point. So now now that I've got it behind the hook point, oh, first thing I did, I've got um, I've got two medium black bead chain eyes is that going to focus on that or not so so it was on a string a big string of bead, bead chain eyes um and uh, and i just cut, cut two of them off mine happened to come in a pack it's a long story uh larry's right you can buy these things by the roll there's nothing wrong with doing that uh the ones by the roll will rust but you're gonna have caught so many fish by the time that gets to that point you're not even gonna be worried about it uh so so I've got my I've got my uh, my my thread just just past the 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 tip, and all I'm going to do is lay my uh, my bead chain up across it, and I'm going to tie it in crosswise to that hook chain. I'm just going to put some cross uh, cross wraps on it, run a few figure eights over it to lock it in place. run a couple underneath it and that should hold that right there so that's actually back just a little bit farther than I would have liked but it'll work just fine but you can see now I have a tripod right so I've got sort of a wide back if I turn this you can see better so I've got sort of a wide back and then the, the bead on the front and then just this head in between and that's going to create a ton of pull on that fly to pull it down now, from here, any piece of drag that I put into this fly is going to be behind that, so uh, uh, on the hook side, so that it drags that, that piece of it up. And actually, I should, well, I'll leave it there. Um, the body of this is going to be a little bit wonky because I do have that tied back just a little farther than I would like, but it's fine. So the next step, something that Trevor uh, is also famous for, is tying really far back on the bend. And that's what Larry Red mentioned that when he said, you know, on the trouser worm, uh, you can do it like trouser worm where you go clear back on the bend. That's one of the things that uh, that Trevor does. It's a little hard to manage, but it really makes it, it makes a difference in how when that fly. And I'll show you when I have this all tied up. But when it's standing up, how upright that tail eventually stands. Instead of laying out like this, that tail should stand almost straight up. So I'm going to take and wrap this back to the bend until I'm basically horizontal with the uh, um, uh, with the earth, right? Now I've got the natural pine squirrel zonker, and this is the very small stuff, right? So this is that really, really uh, um, small zonker strips, not the wide ones. Too, too wide and you'll, uh, uh, your fly won't, um, 
uh, it, it's it's going to look way too bulky on the back end. So it's the it's the the real thin zonker strip. Just a small piece of it. This is actually longer than I'll eventually trim it down to. Um, but but the, because I'm eventually going to want to be just a little longer than the than the length of the hook. But I'm going to tie this whole thing in to get started. Um, and all I'm going to do is expose some of the leather here on the front end. Just pull some hair off to expose a very small, maybe like sixteenth of an inch piece of that of that leather. Uh, so I have something to tie to. Dan, now, you're, so you're tying yeah. like pretty far down the barb. Is there any like tricks or, you know, is, can that be a frustrating place to tie on? It's a really frustrating place to tie on the hook because uh, your, your thread wants to slip down, right? It, instead of the tension pulling it, when you're, you know, gravity tension pulling against the, the hook, now I'm so far down the bend, it's actually pulling it so that the thread wants to slide. So you end up kind of tying horizontally for a minute. And you got to, and you're constantly bringing it up. So you can see right here, my thread is actually spreading itself out because it's slid down. So I'm constantly having to keep that thread together when I'm tying almost horizontally. And then I'm going to take that. Now I'm going to take the uh, the zonker with this little exposed piece of leather, and I'm just going to give it a real loose wrap at that bend here. Uh, maybe I'm going to give it a loose wrap here. And then I'm going to straighten it on the hook to where I want it. And then I'm going to give it a couple of, of tighter wraps. But you got to be careful because you can cut through that leather. So a couple of tighter wraps, and then I'm going to wrap up until it's covered. It's, it's a, it is a difficult place to uh, to to uh, um, to wrap because you're kind of wrapping. You're constantly wrapping at a different angle when you're this high up. Now I'm just going to come up to behind my two eyes and let it rest there for a second because it doesn't hang right elsewhere. My next that's a tricky step. that's a tricky spot to tie in tie in stuff, and it's really it's it's kind of easier to just do it and not explain it. You know, as you, it's it, it's it's kind of intuitive once you start doing it. It, it, it makes sense. You have to have this, this upward tension. Yeah, constantly. Right. You're pulling. You're actually pulling up against. And then you have to wrap back up to the top to let your 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 thread hang, and then you kind of wrap back down. Yeah, so it's a constant process there. So let's see, do I have my wax in here? Uh, if not, I'll just go without it. Yeah, I do. Um, so uh, I'm going to use this Cohen's. Uh, I put it in this little container, but this Cohen's carp dub, uh, which I just absolutely love. I don't even know if it's still made anymore, but I've got a bunch of it. This is the Cray. I'll show you some here. You can see from a color point of view, it's it's got it's primarily orange, but it's got blues and grays and greens. It's a real mottled color. And I like that because I just don't see a lot of solid colors in nature. You catch a crayfish. You, even if you catch, like what Larry was mentioning, the green worm, I'm sure it's green in real life. But if you take that and actually get down and look at it, you'd be like, well, it's green, but it's got little flecks of black, and there's like little strikes in it. So I'm a real big fan of, of Cohen's uh uh, bark dub. You grab just a little pinch of it here. Whoops. Forgot to put my wax on my thread. Um, Dan, uh, we've got a question. Dan yeah. is wondering why not tilt the hook in the jaws? You could do that, um, but then you're going to have to move it. Um, and I do, and maybe this is just user error. I have had problems with my hook popping out of my jaws when I get it tilt, tilted down too far. I just don't know if it's grabbing the same sort of surface area or not. Yeah. Um, but it's certainly worth a try. Um, and uh, um, if you did that, it would make a lot of sense. The problem is it's a curve. So it would be wrap, 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 adjust, wrap, 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 adjust until you got it to until you were completely horizontal. Yeah. So Larry, I've put on, I've put on about – Yeah. go ahead, Larry. Oh, I was just going to say, Larry sort of spoke to that. He just said, yeah, it might be a time trade-off having to do what yep, you just said. So, Once you do it a few times, it really isn't isn't uh, the worst thing in the world. Um, but yeah, the first couple times, just expect you're going to be like, holy cow, that feels a, feels a little different. Yeah, exactly. You're like, you're pulling, you're pulling up all of a sudden. So I've got a, a, a little noodle, dubbing noodle here, and I'm going back down the bend, the shank and the bend, and I'm going to tie that over. What the piece I just tied in to really lock that in, but with the dubbing on there, it won't cut through the leather. So I can really put some tension and lock that in tight. And then I'm going to dub back up. Whoops. 
I'm going to back up to behind my two uh, my two eyes right here. Okay, and I'm going to let that just just be in there. So now I've got and look, general hackle feather. I don't care if it's pheasant rump or or you know hen hackle or whatever you got. I actually pulled this off the shoulder of a of a ringneck pheasant. It's just it's just got to be so that the uh, that the uh, uh, feather are not so long that they're about the same length. They're maybe twice the width of your uh, of your gap there. Maybe one and a half times the width of your gap. And you don't need much feather for this. This is a fly because of how tight you are tight you are back here that you can overwhelm with hackle if you put too much on. So it really doesn't need to be much feather. You're just trying to get enough to put maybe a turn or two so that it opens up, gives it a little body on that back end without actually adding any bulk is sort of is sort of what the goal is. So I'm just gonna strip that down and cut a chunk off and now I'm gonna take I like to do it this way people do it all different ways I like to reverse these and give myself a little something to hang on to by pulling the uh, the feather fibers down and then I'm gonna before I even put it on there kind of train them to be out just a little bit here because I'm gonna put those wraps on I want that thing with, with, the, with that really facing back so all I'm doing now is I'm gonna tie in this back part right here I'm gonna tie this in to my on top of my uh, of my uh, um, my hook shank there, give it a couple of good wraps, and then I actually like to take my thread to the front and let it get out of the way. There's going to come a point where I'm going to be holding with my hands and quick trying to get it back there to tie it in, but but palmering that hackle can get to be a little bit of a challenge. I'm not going to use a palmer tool or anything, so I just kind of like to clear the space that I have there. With this dense of a feather, I'm really probably only putting one turn on. We'll see, one or two turns. And I'm just going to palmer this over right behind those, those uh, um, bead chain eyes. We're going to go around once. That. And then as a matter of fact, I'll probably, yeah, in this case, I'm going to go at least another half turn around. This is a little bit better. So I've got that pulled back like that. That works good. And now I'm taking my thread back. And I'm just grabbing that uh, the tip of that feather, which I've lost hold of, which is always a problem. While you're tying, oh. I'm actually, I, I didn't think about, well, there wasn't a great picture of this for Larry's, but while you're tying, I'm just going to kind of, show people Good. what this end result is Good. kind of going for. Yeah. And it's such a ubiquitous, I mean, this, this palmering of like one feather, you know, it started from like, you know, I guess it's inspired originally by the partridge and orange soft hackle, but it's such, it's such a ubiquitous skill when you're tying cart flies these days. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I mean, and it's like some, like some flies are a little bit more user friendly because they have a longer stem. You know, your, your chicken feathers, your hen, hen saddles has a long feather, um, a long stem on it. So it's easy to handle the palmer it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, a pheasant that you shot is pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> like to use as a feather. Yeah. And, and it's got some really unique colors and some really unique iridescences that I like to use, but the, the feathers are not, super conducive to tying as you can see there i actually lost hold of it and had to rewrap it because it's real stiff and and uh but it, it'll actually looks like it's going to work out real good so i've got a couple of turns in behind and now the next step is uh, is once again i'm going to run some wax on here and i'm going to dub another noodle in my case i'm using the same dubbing i used before this is where trevor went with like a pink hot spot I've got so much hook shank up here, more than I normally would have liked, that I, 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 I'm definitely going to keep this the same color. So it'd be too much to be a, a hot spot. It would start to look, it would just be too much color on there. Now here, one thing to pay attention to is you're going to put a turn or two behind your, your eyes, one, maybe two, but not too many because you can really quickly start to crimp all of those, that hackle down, and you can lay that whole thing back which is which will defeat the purpose of having it and then i put maybe a figure eight over my eyes and then i run actually I'll, i'm going to take that figure eight off i've got too much dubbing on here 
So I'll put a wrap or two over that eye, and then I'll go ahead and run this this uh, hackle right up to behind the uh, the bead, like that. That's looking pretty good. So now, now that I've got it there, I'll grab my whip finish tool, and I'm going to put two whip finishes on this. So I'm not going to use any any uh, cement, and I'm putting them behind the bead. One, two, three. One, two, three. And then I'm trimming off my uh, my thread. And then the very last step, you don't want to get this piece wrong, is, and I take it out of the vise for this. I'm going to now turn that over, make sure it looks kind of how I want it to look, and it does. And this is when I'm really going to say, all right, how much do I want to shorten that tail? I've got a little body. I've got too much tail on there. It, in my, I don't know why, but for me, it just always works better to actually get it out of the vise, look at it, how it's going to look in the water, and then say, okay, that's how much I want to take off. Do be careful when you take it off. You do not want to just cut it across like this. You'll lose. You'll you'll end up with a haircut. Yeah, exactly. You'll end up with a haircut on your uh, on your on your uh, um, your fur back there. So you want to really make sure you just pull back and open up some of that fur and just trim the leather. Maybe right there, and then you can lay it back out. There you go. Yep, and then when you're done, that's what you got. You got a you got a zonker tail. It moves great in the water. Breathes, really waves. When it's stripped, it really wags. It looks like it's got a wide body, but there's really not much going on uh, in terms of to create any type of drag or splash. And then you've got the the uh, tripod front, so it, that thing will land on its head and stand on its head every single time. So that's couple, it, man. That's good loving. Couple of questions, Dan. So, yeah. um, like. Uh, remind us what situation uh so like under what conditions would you like would this be your go-to to tie on yeah if they're eating damselfly nymphs i really love to go with this and the way i look and see if they're eating damselfly nymphs is number one are there a bunch of damselflies in the air right those light blue suckers um but secondly damselfly nymphs are mid-column oftentimes right they swim in open water and then when they migrate, they all migrate to standing vegetation that stands out of the water. They climb up them, and then they sh then they sh shed their nymphal husk and turn into those blue flying things. So when I see carp that are mouthing at the bottom, at the base of vegetation or up ve vegetation, that's my first thing I always think of is there's the damselfly nymphs climbing on that vegetation. In which case... That's not the only place those nymphs are. So I'm putting these in front of fish in open water. I'm putting them in front of fish that are tailed up around the base of that vegetation. And the good thing about this is, as far as carp forage go, damselfly and dragonfly nymphs are quite active. They're, they move a lot. They're actually carnivorous. They eat everything from little minnows to other nymphs and stuff while they're in their, their nymphal stage. So, um, so you can, you get an opportunity to give a little action to your fly and hopefully, you know, get a carp that'll chase it down. You can swim it in front of them. Um, um, so I'm looking for, uh, situations where I see either that behavior around those beds, or if I see, um, it, it, in open water, this, this, this works real well if they're, if they're, there's a, some type of hatch. We can, I don't know what it really is. The local old boys call it a lake fly, but we've got something that comes out of the bottom in the middle of the river, middle of the lakes, and the carp. Well, you can see them moving up and down the column, out mid column, out, out near mid column, eating things. In that case, I would tie on a McLovin that's as lightly weighted as I can tie, and I would try to swim that thing in front of them because there's something moving up through the column. Um, and then the last scenario is. If I'm, all, if I'm in a crayfish situation, jumbled rocks and gravel and looking real crayfishy, and I got fish on the prowl, it, it, it looks just crayfishy enough with that sort of wide body from that hackle and, uh, and, the, and the motion that it, that it gives when you move it through the water that, um, that I'm not afraid at all to pull this out when, when there's crayfish around. Yeah. Uh, so when you're finding fish doing those, what would, uh, what would fish have to be doing for you to – cut that fly off and tie something up something else up. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a really good question um and yet it happens to me uh, more than more than i'd like to admit 
really uh, the ma the number one thing is um, if I get rejections. If I get times when I'm like that fish looked at that fly and did not eat it, I'm like I've got some, I've got to do something else. Um, and uh, or if if um, they're really sort of like rooting in mud, they're probably not digging out. The damsel, there's lots of nymphs and stuff that live in the benthos in the bottom. And damselfly nymphs are not one of them. They, they're open water swimmers, right? So when they start, when I notice that behavior, those super tails where they're like headstand and their tails out of the water and they're spinning in a circle, you know, they may eat it because it looks edible, but it ain't what it ain't, it ain't damselfly that they're after in that case. Sure. Um, so the rejections. The other thing is it's a little harder for as a fly. Uh, it, it's a relatively quick sinking fly, no matter how lightly weighted you have it. When you have the bead and the and the head and the chain, and so if I get to a point where um, I really need to get neutrally buoyant, it's not my fly. I'm cutting it off. I got to go with something else. It's coming with a beefier tail, something with a lot less weight on the front end of the hook, maybe no bead at all, um, yeah. and, and trying to trying to keep that thing neutrally buoyant. That can be really frustrating because there are times when I, I just this last year, I was in a situation where I was in maybe six feet of water. It was clear to the bottom. It was like we were in an aquarium. Those fish were three feet down, and they were clearly eating damselfly nymphs. They were chasing them around. The problem I had was my damselfly nymphs were weighted, and they were just shooting right through their feeding zone. And I couldn't keep them in the zone long enough to intercept those fish. It's a, it's a tricky game, right? Because you've gone from two dimensions, which is what we usually fish in, which is, are, am I, you know, laterally uh, and am I to, and, and then is my timing right to three dimensions? Because now you're not only got to be on online left to right and online front and center, but you got to be online up and down also. So it's a tricky thing. And if you can get neutral buoyancy, it's a lot easier because you can kind of start to remove one of those dimensions, right? You, it's going to be at their level of the water column. It's just a matter of was your cast accurate. But, um, so, so that's a really frustrating scenario. There are some excellent other damselfly patterns. I just haven't, didn't happen to have any of them tied up. Yeah. And so I was trying to fish a fly that was too heavily weighted for a situation that caused for, called for a non-weighted fly. Um, yeah, no weight woolly booger is, is exactly right. That's a perfect way to go. Something in olive. Um, and, uh, and, and that would have been exactly right. But unfortunately, I wasn't in that situation. So I was trying to tie fish for something that wasn't weighted for my situation quite correctly and there's nothing more in my opinion that's the most frustrating of all because you're like i'm doing everything right and there's literally nothing i can do to hold that thing at the right point in the water column for these fish um yeah and then this what i did uh in you know brown and black and, and naturals olive is great um orange or sort of a burnt orange is can be real good black is awesome if you're in dirty water Black is great because you get that awesome contrast. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, um, and those are uh, uh, so you know. Don't be afraid to vary the the colors. I was going to say that's a good transition point. I'm going to flip my camera around because I'm about to whip up a black fly. Then, so um, hopefully my hands don't end up getting in the way here too much. Um, I've already tied on my eyes. Um, I'm going to tie this one a little bit heavier than, um, than what, so we've been tying stuff, especially with bead chain. Dan, yours is a little bit heavier because you had that bead on there as well. This, uh, so I'm going to tie a black Betty, um, which just a reminder, this is the one that's on the cover of Dan's book, um, 101 car flies. That's a Jim Pankowitz fly, Mr. P. It he's, is. uh, he's, he's old school. He's old school, even for the old school guys. And uh, yeah, he's tagged in the uh, the post uh, that I made uh, most recently advertising this uh, listing materials. So uh, you can go check him out. Look at his blog. Yeah, good stuff. Um, and so this is one I I I often will have a couple of rods rigged up in the boat, and I usually have a pink worm on one, and I usually have a black betty tied on another and then if i have a third rigged up that is usually my super light neutrally buoyant or um or just like much slower sinking parachute -y fly for fish that are really looking for damsels um kind of up high same same here same yeah. here same if you, here if you have the ability to fish from a boat you can have three rods rigged or, and you or, should or two and, yeah. and you should um, Luke, let me ask you a quick question. Uh, your eyes, lead eyes, 
No, these are just uh, some uh, brass eyes. Um, okay, oh, but I mean, they're solid. They're not bead chain. They're solid eyes. Yeah, these are solid. Yeah, the ones I'm using are uh, from Allen. Um, 4.8 millimeters. So this is a bit on the heavier side for sure. Um, you could go still lighter than this uh, and heavier than bead chain, and that would be fine. Um, but every once in a while, you want just kind of a pretty heavy fly, and so that's that's what I'm tying here today. Yep. I go I go both ways with the Black Betty. I do, you know, bead chain and I have lead eye ones too. Yep. 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 What, uh, what's, that tail, what's that tail yeah. material? Uh this is just like a red tubing. Uh it might be this might be Orvis's stretch tubing. Um but just kind of yeah, just I use a red tubing. Yep. If you guys if you guys want the cheap hack of the red vinyl rib tubing, it's called crystal thread. <laughs> And it's kind of thick. It can be like 0.8 or 0.7 millimeters, which it's a little bit thicker than your standard like vinyl D rib, but it's the same stuff. You can get it on like on the internet for not expensive, and you have a lifetime supply of the stuff. So, Larry is the expert when it comes to finding bulk materials in random places on the internet. It's, it's absolutely amazing. It, it is it's easier than it used to be with Amazon. Honestly, Amazon had a lot of stuff, which whatever. You, you can have your pins about Amazon, but uh, you can get lifetime supplies of fly tying materials for inexpensive. <laughs> if you like if you like to cheap, you know, synthetic stuff like I do. <laughs> so Dan was talking about, uh, you know, kind of using some different materials. So, you know, according to the book or, you know, the way Jim P ties it, I think he uses uh, Peacock Curl. Um, I'm just using a black chenille, uh, yep. and this is a bit bigger and flashier than I normally use it. Uh, my old favorite uh, chenille I was just out of, so I'm using this today, and I don't expect there being any consequences. Um, and again, I'm tying this on that C14 glow bug hook. Uh, I, it just seemed like a really easy thing to do for this video and talking about flies to just be like, we're going to tie them all with the same hook. Uh, you could vary it. Um, I often tie this with a little bit longer shank hook, um, like a two X strong nymph hook or something like that. Like a one, one X short two X, uh, stout. I'll do that. But, uh, yep. I'm just tying it on the C14 today because you can tie all these flies on the same hook. Um, you know, you can, you can certainly change proportions if you want, but, uh, you also don't have to, if you just want to tie on the same hook and, and just, just deal with that. Larry, did you notice how much more fancy Luke is than us with his rotor? Use it, actually using the rotary function. He is, yeah, he is using it. I know it is fancy. Yeah, you know what, guys? You know what? No. We are tying cart flies here. Uh, so I am a fan of Brahma hen hackle, but all I'm, I don't have any black, and so what I'm using here is I think just some uh, shorter fibered schloppen that I've got here. So. Mm. Um, just a, a nice soft hackle is I is great, uh, but just use what you got. You know, it'll it'll probably be fine. The main thing to focus on in all this is just getting in front of fish and uh, you know worrying about your presentation and all that stuff. Um, another point that I'll make about this fly is I talked about keeping some different weights in the boat, and one of the big reasons I do that is um, not only for like drop rate. Uh, because uh, some of the time I'm dealing with current, but often I am not. Uh, a big reason I do this is uh, for windy days. Um, oh. It's really awesome to have a heavier fly. And all you have to do is reach your fly out. And if you're trying to dap fish, your fly isn't blown back at you if you're moving into the wind. Um, and it can just be, uh, it can be really helpful to think of weight as, you know, helping you in that regard not just for um not not just for for sync rate drop rate yeah sync rate yeah your pre rate. It, it gives you good control with your presentation in the wind and i i'm in the same boat and wading in in from a boat uh, we, we are literally um, in the same boat sometimes yeah we're in the same we're in the figurative same boat and when we fish we're literally in the same boat yes but uh you know it's windy okay. in the great plains here and, uh, you know, a little extra weight on your fly. I mean, it, you know, it, it doesn't sink a whole lot faster, um, you know, when you have a lot of hackle. 
Um, lead will sink faster. It's a, it is more dense, but really it get, it it cuts through the wind and it cuts through that chop and that yeah. shallow chop. So yeah, Ellie, I agree. Yeah. I agree with the vice grips comment. Real car flies are tied with vice grips. <laughs> Actually, Larry usually holds them in his teeth and and has one hand has a beer in one hand and and a, and the hook in his teeth. Sometimes he holds it in his teeth and then I tie like. <laughs> There, I, we, you know what we did have. We there is a cool picture from uh, from a tying trip, uh, a grass cart trip, where Luke was spinning up some uh, some elm seed flies on the way there. That was pretty cool. That cool. I'll, have to, I'll have to post that one of these days. Good times. So I'm doing like Dan, uh, just a double whip finish here. Um, I didn't count how many times I went around with the hackle. Um, I just I just went around till it looked okay to me. Um, I, I think I tend to like a little bit uh, bushier hackle sometimes, or I don't like it to look too thin. Uh, that that might be good or bad. I'm really not sure. Uh, a little bit thinner probably is not a terrible thing. Um, I guess I this is just whatever trips my trigger. So um, you can you can always pluck it out later too. You can always yeah. pluck it out later. Yep. And the carp or not? This is uh, I mean a decent sized fly. It's not yeah. tiny. Uh, but it's definitely not gigantic either. Um, and that tail, I could trim that tail back and that'd be fine. But right now I think it's a fine length. Stands out well. Um, is, is there, so I know Mr. P doesn't do it and maybe that's just why you guys don't. Is, is there a thought to not running some dubbing over those eyes and in front of that and, 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 and in front? I, I realize it's simply an aesthetic thing, um, but uh, I have trouble leaving the fly without, without getting some of that dubbing over there. That's a good question. I don't even do that with my like uh, pink worms, like Larry's pattern. Uh, yeah, I don't even I don't even wrap dubbing that up that far. I uh, I stop all mine before it. So I'm not sure, you know, what there is to that. That camera doesn't focus, uh, but. Yeah, you know, I I think there there I've seen an argument maybe about. Uh, about maybe it deadening the impact if you're really worried about the fly splatting down, maybe that can have a, an effect. I mean, it's, it's, you know, this is like a, almost a different like evolution from uh, like the, like the backstabber pattern. Cause those, those, those flies have the hackle in front of the weight, yep. you know, that like school of thought, the Jay Zimmerman ones. And, and this one, you know, I have an original uh, carp carrot here, which was kind of like the the rip off the original partridge and orange from J that Jim P tied. Absolutely. Um, and then it, it kind of brand. No, this that this that spawned the you know hackle behind the eye, and like this this fly does not have any you know. So the the original was just bare thread on there, and which it seems like my darker flies I kind of leave that way, and then I have olive ones that I ended up tying some dubbing around the eyes. So I don't know. Um, I think, you know, later down, you know, the later evolutions of the fly, um, like the hybrid worm, it typically doesn't, at least the ones I, you know, John originally tied don't have that. Um, but then like the carp crack, the JP Lipton kind of tied those, he, you know, that dubbing is his thing. And like this, you know, the, you know, the spectral dubbings that has a mix of colors and stuff, you know, so, you know, I, I think well, if you want to take the time to do it, it definitely looks better to the angler. But well, uh, JP, JP went as far as matching the color of his bead chain to the color he was tying. Like he was right. all about that sort of consistency of color. And he made beautiful flies. And they caught the hell out of the fish, too. Um, I'm sure the carp don't care about any of this. <laughs> they do not care about any of this. One thing uh, Suni asks is... Uh, we think color triggers like an eat like do we think colors a trigger or just a visual cue for the angler i i feel like it's especially for the angler but uh i don't know what you guys thoughts uh, uh, personally i think it helps the angler more in mo in most instance instances um Again, I have had situations where carp preferred like a more crayfish or like a natural colored fly, and they will flat out refuse like a like a pink or red or you know or natural like worm colored like hybrid or, or San Juan worm. So I mean, and again, that's kind of like the the like the rare situation. But if you go if you kind of go through like the know your forage thing, if you know fish are eating you know olive you know brown damsel or dragonfly nymphs. I mean, they're not, they're probably not going to turn that down. 
But if you can't see them eat it, you know, this is a visual game. I mean, you're going to have trouble, you know, hooking, hooking one of those fish. So, so it's, it's, it's such a spectacular question. And, you know, John fishes his two-fly rig, and he'll tie a trouser worm, which is just bright red, and then 12 inches down, he'll tie his Montana – or not – yeah, he'll tie his Montana hybrid. And the Montana hybrid's real small. It's got a red tail, but it's hard to see. And, it's, and a lot of Johns – I fish Columbia with John a lot of times. You know, he's in waist-deep water. So you're not seeing a Montana hybrid on the bottom. But you can still see that trou- that trouser worm. But the trouser worm, and while it catches maybe uh, 15% of John's fish, I mean, they do eat it. And there's some there's some benefits to splitting the head and stuff, which I'll talk about in just a second. Mostly that's because John's using that, so he knows exactly where his Montana hybrid is and when the carp makes a move to that, he can set the hook. So he's trying to cover both bases of what Larry just covered, which is how do we make it look like what they're eating and make it something we can see? And that's how that's John's answer to that is effectively like yeah. I mean, it's kind of like putting on a strike indicator in a sort of weird, sort of weird carp kind of way right and or a, a hopper dropper kind of setup so um now there's other benefits so what john will do is well there's two things you need to remember about carp one they primarily eat with their sense of taste and smell vision is like maybe third or fourth down the list of how they identify food and we're trying to trick them with just their sense of vision because they don't taste or smell right so we are trying to get them to recognize that this is food, even though it doesn't taste, it doesn't smell right, it doesn't taste right, and those are their primary senses for, for sensing food. So there is something to be said about making sure it looks like what they're eating, otherwise they just aren't even going to identify it as a potential food item. Um, now, on the other hand, um, you got to be able to see it, and they also have a blind spot uh, in front of them. So carp eyes are on the very side of their head, which means their field of vision is a cone coming off of here and a cone coming off of here. And where it crosses, they have vision in front of them. But there's a cone in the center there that they have a blind spot. So when John's throwing two flies, and he is an absolute master at this, he will throw his cast and he'll do the drag and drop. Only when he's dragging, the second fly, the back fly, is the one that's pinned to the water. The top fly is actually out of the water. He drags it. Till it's on one side of the fish's head, and rather than a normal drop, he gives his rod a flip, and he takes that front fly and he sets it over here, and they come down on either side. Both fields of vision are then the carp has 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 an option. So that does two things: it makes sure that the flies are seen. I actually, when I get too close to a fish, can have a tendency to get my fly too close to in front of them, and I don't get I don't get, they don't see it, and then I got to back it up. John never has that problem because he's putting them on the sides of their heads. And the second thing, that this is where John's genius. John knows this is about seeing the eat. And when, when it's on the side of their head, they have to turn. And so he's making them commit one way or the other. And when they commit to one side, he sets the hook. And because there's a fly on either side, so there's a pretty good chance they eat one of the two damn flies. And in, in either way they go, he knows to set the hook. Yeah. So it's interesting. That's a great question, Luke, when you say, like, how do we balance being able to see the fly versus it looking like the food? John goes with two flies. In my case, I mean, I fish two flies when I'm by myself. I don't put anglers on two flies because it is a, it's a challenge to manage. I don't always fish two flies by myself, but I do a lot of times. Um, but uh, but that's the concern. Like with this fly, when I tie this fly on, this specific fly, I'm not going to tie this on for a beginner because it is going to be shockingly difficult to know where this fly is in the water because it's going to look like everything else in the water. Yeah, And, and that's going to be a lot more um, setting the hook on conviction. Uh, or, you know, like Justin Watkins calls it, um, uh, uh, it's like a sixth sense, it's faith, I think he calls it, which is, I'm smart enough to know that's where my fly is, that carp's mouth is right there, even though I can't actually see it happen, I, I'm going to set the hook. And he hooks a lot of fish that way, in the mouth, like fair caught, he knew it ate, just, he, you didn't actually see the process occur, and, and that's a tough skill to, to get down. That's John, a lot of that comes from... Yeah, get like actually seeing them eat enough times, you know, that's such an important thing. And then you start to sort of read those subtle cues that you might be able, you know, where you can tell in the absence of seeing their mouth consume it, you know, you're reading these other really subliminal 
cues. Subliminal is not the right word, but something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Really you get you, you get good at p putting that fly. You know, when you like personally, it's it's like I have a lot of confidence, like a heavy fly, just because I know it can get down to where the fish is. And if you get, when, when you do this a lot, you get adept at like John does, like you put it, you don't put it on their center line. You actually move it a little bit. So, you know, if you, if you're familiar with the sink rate of your fly and then you, you know that the fish turns when you, when you intuitively know that it hits the bottom, that's like the sixth sense. Like it's like once the fish turns, it ate it really. So. Yeah. yeah and you know, John, John and Justin both talk about this. It's really important. It took me a long time to learn it. Hook sets are free. Hook sets are free. I there you I, you wouldn't if you if you came out and watched me on a bad day you'd be like something's wrong with that guy because I'm setting the hook and they're not there I'm laying it back out I'm dragging and dropping it down I think he ate it I'm setting the hook they're not there I'm laying it back out I'm dragging and dropping it down um, and, and 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 so and that's not because I'm you know I'm not like trying to snag him in the mouth or anything it's just it's a really difficult skill to get down when has it picked it up. And then remember, we talked about this last time. They got a half, you got a half second. They pick up a lot of stuff that ain't food, identify it as not food, and expel it in the course of their life. That when they pick this up, it takes them a half second to say, that's not food, and spit it back out. So you probably, I would suggest, especially if you're a beginner, if you got feeding carp and you're getting the fly in front of them, you're getting eats that you don't realize are happening, period. That is absolute, there's no way around that. Um, and so the better you, you get at setting the hook and knowing when to set the hook, that's when you're going to get, that's when you're really going to outfish people. Uh, Sonny reminds me here. Uh, it's really well, paraphrasing super trooper. Here is probably the best thing, you know, you know why we do a lot of things, but really when it comes down to it, you know, a good carp angler never really knows why they do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Might be our sixth or even our seventh sense. <laughs> it's definitely, it's definitely like my my sixth, maybe seven, maybe seven. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it 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 really it really is a um, a lot of it starts to become intuitive. Where to put the fly? You know, like Larry just mentioned right now, not on the center line. He's putting it to the side. Uh, if 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 Larry's like me, it took a number of seasons to figure out how far to the side. Am I even getting it to the side? How come they're not eating it when I'm putting it right in front of them? Like that, that's just a piece of the puzzle that you start to do instinctually. And it's even really hard to get across to a new angler. All of these subtle things like, oh, wait, I forgot to tell him I put it two inches to the side when I set it down, not right in front of him. And, um, and the hook set one and the eats one is a really challenge. Some of the things that you can look for. So, you know, in a perfect world, that fly's falling, and that fish tips up, and you see his mouth, white mouth flare, and he eats it. Then, you know, that'll get to a heart pumping. But if you're looking down on him or you don't have a good visual, there'll be a gill flare. Their tail will oftentimes speed up or they'll give a little turn. There's a lot of subtle body language. I would suggest, especially when you're first starting, any change in behavior, period, set the hook on and see what happens. Yeah. Um, one question that uh... – Ricky asked was, uh, you know, what hook size is too big and what's too small? Um, and I've been reflecting on this. I've been sitting here looking at a pink worm reflecting on it. Uh, so we've talked about a range of sizes, especially with a glow bug hook by Gamakatsu. We're tying on size two to size eight. So that gives you a range. Uh, one thing that occurred to me is maybe a hook that is no bigger than half of the ultimate size you want your fly to be or something like that. Um, I don't know if that's a good guide at all, but, um, you know, at a certain point, if, if your hook gets too big, you can only tie so small of a fly on it that looks good. Right. Yep. Um, so anyways, I don't know if that's a good, good guide or not, Rick, but, um, it's good. It's good. I would say we used to say, and now that with these glow bug hooks, maybe this is not exactly true. Six, eights and tens. Um, a lot of guys tie a lot of flies on tens. You just need to get the gauge right, right? And a wide gauge, six, eights and tens. Um, but, but what you're really looking for is a very short sh shank. I think a general rule, Larry, help me out here if you think this. If I have a hook that's the size of my thumbnail, I'm at the top end. That's that's the size I'm looking for, and that's the top end. And then he, I also noticed he mentioned how small 
I mean, it depends on what they're eating. I've caught carp on a size 20 parachute Adams uh, dry fly, big carp. I've also had big carp straighten me out on those. So the biggest hook you can get away with for the small food organisms that they eat is kind of how I think yeah. about it. Yeah. I would say I, I would err on the side, again, the, from personal experience like you, Dan, I've caught carp on dry flies and bent the hooks out, and it's like, okay – I, I'm gonna I'm going to limit myself to the smallest like C12s, which I think is a size 12, which is which you can get actually you can tie a decent sized like atoms on that if you wanted to. I mean it's gonna be a little wonky. You're gonna definitely want a couple extra turns of hackle if you're doing a parachute atoms. Um, Larry, did but you I tied plenty of egg. Did you say go you're ahead? Tying, sorry. Did you say you're tying that on a C14 or a C12 or C12? Uh, uh, or, uh, no, C, uh, the C14. Oh, oh, I thought you said Size 12. 12. Size 12, sorry. There you go, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, like, the, so I think, I think it goes, I'm pretty sure it goes down to size 12. Um, and, like, I think size 2 is the biggest, which, again, this really isn't all that. It's, it's definitely shorter shank than, like, a size 6, like, SL45, which is kind of like a historical, like, so, hook some guys use for carp. Yeah. Um, the hook, but the gap is bigger, and really, you know, there's some hooks that are the same length, but they have an even bigger gap, and that's kind of like what this hook is here. I mean, it's really the same length, but it's just got a, it's even more of just a big honking gap, which, you know, the physics of it, if as long as it's, you know, heat treated or whatever correctly, it's not going to bend out, um, which is a plus for me. Like, I, there's nothing worse than bending a hook out. So oh, I, I would limit myself to like an egg style or salmon style hook. Um, or glow bug style hook or like a saltwater live bait and that 10 to 12 size just make your pattern work on that hook <laughs> or i mean or you know but who knows if you have you know if, if you're in water if you're in open water in a lake and you know you have the ability to play a fish out and you know not horse it in you know go for a, a nymph hook or a dry fly hook i mean you know i'm not telling you to not do that but <laughs> It does. It does limit your. It does limit the number you land, and it takes you a lot longer um, with those uh, uh, um, narrow gauge hooks. So there's really kind of. I think maybe Larry distilled it down really well. He, giving you like a specific, we can give you some, you know C14s or like specifics on hooks, fours and all that size, sixes and tens. But um, really, there's just three things to keep in mind, and you can walk into any hook store and find hooks that'll work, and that is. Is the shank shorter than my thumbnail? Is the gauge big enough that it can hold a 20-pound fish, right? So a serious gauge like a glow bug hook, glow bug hook. And is the gate big enough that it's, I've got a lot of chance to get real good purchase on the on the fish's mouth? And then whatever whatever creates that combination or whatever uh, um, hook you, you can find in that combination, you know, you're, you're pretty much set on. Um, um, the, 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 the one other thing maybe is – uh, you, you you know it can't be a brittle hook. Uh, some of the saltwater hooks are are strong, but but kind of brittle. And, um, and I've snapped a lot of hooks on on carp. They they will do things to you. The first time I had a couple of redfish guides up here, I remember one of them hooked a carp, uh, and it took off for the other side of the world, and and uh, was just ripping line off his reel. And he looked at me and said, "I didn't know there were fish that pulled that hard in fresh water." And they they will surprise you uh, sometimes. So you gotta you gotta uh, um, you know you want to make sure you've got a, a hook that's heat treated and, and sort of a quality uh, hook. Yep. Uh, yeah. Spoonie asked if uh, we've had repeat bends on that, Larry. I know you have. I've I've definitely had them bend out. You can you can tie on them. You know, give them a try if it's uh, if it's really fits the pattern that you're wanting to tie. But it, you know, if you're getting double digit fish that are really really pull in are really really going to work you you might find it bending or you just might have to play them a little more carefully so what's up Danny? I, I would uh i would say if you're if you're tying like um moorish hoppers or some kind of like dry fly like that sl45 i do like that for like my grass cart flies just because it is a little bit lighter it does just physically lighter hook um compared to like a, a bigger you know one of these owner like size twos um just the gauge is lighter so there's so it 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 works better on like a dry fly platform 
if you're in if you're into that but close quarters i won't i just won't use that hook for that if you know anymore um if I, if it's you know i just i'll just i'll save those flies for smaller fish or uh you know open water fish but if i'm if i'm in the if i'm in the thick weeds where i have to put you know that fish runs is going to run right into a tree or a bush or right thicker in the weeds you need a stouter hook just to just not break off instantly and and the sl45 frankly in my experience just will bend out right away <laughs> it just cool. ha- i mean again i mean I, I i tend to use pretty heavy tippet most of the time i mean I'm, i don't use much less than you know 15 pound and again that's just the water that i fish a lot of the time so it's it's kind of those factors that go into it but um it's just not my first recommendation but if that's all you got you know it's gonna do it's gonna work fine so Larry also brought up something interesting that you, 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 you need to factor in <clears throat> is what, how are you having to play these fish? Um, I mean, I was in a situation with Larry one time where we had 18 inch long carp that turned up, that blew up a bass rod. I mean, exploded okay, three pieces boom, three boom, pieces like, in front of him because yeah. we were in a jungle and his only option was, let them eat and then just lock that fish up and and the, the hook held the tippet held but the, but the rod exploded in that case 15 pound tippet <clears throat> stout 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 hooks you don't have a choice now on the other hand when i'm fishing my big lake out here where it's you know i got sand for a long ways i can get a lot more delicate back off my drag a little bit and let the fish take me into my backing yeah i'll probably you know have a little a bit of an anxiety attack until i get the line back on the reel and all that but, you know, I have that option to compensate for my hook and my tippet size. Um, but if you're in combat style fishing, which with carp is all too often, you're in situations where, like, they're in the junk, um, you, you just got to get as stout as they're willing to, to give to you. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, adjust based on some of those circumstances you've got to. It's not, it's not, it is fun. You know, you guys have experienced this in your boat. It is fun when you are in open water with not a lot of snags to click that reel down just a few or that, that reel down just a few notches and, and say, all right, we're going to let this, we're going to, we're just going to see how far this hat carp will actually go. You know what I mean? <laughs> Put something lighter on and, and handle it that way. As far as tippet sizes, I was surprised to hear 15 pound. Um, I do fish, I'm, I fish tapered uh, a mono leaders, no, no floral for me, but um, um, I'm fishing one X, two X, maybe odd X, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get a little, lighter on the, on all of that okay yeah yeah interesting luke i hate to do this to you man but i'm at five percent battery life on my, i was uh, just oh, i was yeah. just about to say you know what guys we we could all talk about this all day so but i think we should wrap up because you know these things can be for other conversations in other places so thanks everyone for logging in signing in joining us all the questions um this will be up as a post uh, feel free to check it out if you're just signing on and want to catch the earlier stuff. So, um, ask questions. We'll see them later too. Yeah. Thanks Larry. Thanks Dan. <laughs> you bet. Appreciate you guys. Everyone. You guys have a good night. See you boys.